Hi, my name is Tom Gullickson. I'm a former ATP Tour tennis player. Uh, I am now. I'm, I was also the Davis Cup captain for the United States for six years. I was the Olympic coach in '96 Olympics in Atlanta when Agassi won the gold medal, and we won the Davis Cup when I was captain in 1995 in Russia in Moscow at the Olympic Stadium. Uh, I retired uh, from the tour and went into coaching. I was a director of coaching for the USTA, the United States Tennis Association, and I helped develop a lot of top uh, professional players, including like Jennifer Capriati, Jim Courier, and, and several others. Um, I'm here now uh, living in Chicago, and I'm working as a consultant to Midtown, and, and, and specifically in the High Performance Program, which is a program here at Midtown for aspiring uh, junior players, and they're all competitive players that play tournaments, both national tournaments, sectional tournaments in the Midwest, and also local uh, Chicago tournaments as well. And it's really enjoyable for me, after working so many years with professional players, to be able to work with younger aspiring players when they're developing their game. You know, I've, we've got kids you know, in the program, you know, anywhere from eight, nine years old all the way to 18 years old. And we're, we're helping a lot of the kids get Division I college scholarships, which is great. A lot of our kids have national rankings in their age groups. And it's really fun to kind of help them with the development process. Because development is a journey, it's not a destination. The goal each time these kids are getting on the tennis court is to get a little bit better. They get 1% better every day. By the end of the year, they'll be three and a half times better than they year were the, at the beginning of the year. So it's a really fun process. And not only are we trying to teach tennis, we're also building you know, good character. You know, and a lot of the skills you learn when you're becoming a competitive tennis player will also serve you very well in, in your personal life and in your business life after tennis. So. Uh, it, it, it's great working with these young people to develop character and also to develop their tennis. Um, this first slide is, is very important. I think I've talked to some of you in this room about, about this. Um, development is a journey. It's not a destination. You know, it was very, very interesting. Uh, two years ago, in the off-season, I sent one of my pro coaches, I was in my last job with the USTA, I was in charge of the pros, the men pros. And I sent one of my young coaches, Peter Lucasen, who played at USC with Stevie Johnson. He was coaching Mackie McDonald and Ernesto Escobedo. And, and Federer invited them to Dubai for two weeks in the off season to train with him. So they went to Dubai for two weeks and they trained with Federer every day. And his coach, uh, Ivan Lubicic, a former Croatian player, very good player, uh, you know, he said, Roger, you know, if you want to beat Nadal, if you want to keep beating Djokovic, you need to get a better backhand. You can't slice your back, you're slicing your backhand too much. You know, you're using a 90, kind of a 90 centimeter head on your racket. We need to switch you. We need to take advantage of technology. So Roger went to a 97, and you know he started hitting over his backhand more, and you know, my coach Peter was there with the two players, and the thing that impressed him most was Roger had already had like 18 Grand Slams, and he had this burning desire in the off season there in Dubai to get better, and every day, he, and he told our guys Ernesto and Mackey. He said, focus on your strengths, because that's what's going to win you the matches. Of course you want to improve your weaknesses, and we all, as players, we all have weaknesses. But when you go to a competitive environment, you want to have your strengths being excellent and very fine-tuned, because you're going to win the match with your A game, with your strengths. And that's one of the takeaways they had from Roger, and the other one was like, 
you know, geez, I'm ranked 120 in the world. This guy's won 18 slams. Why does he have this great urgency to get better? I should have that times 10. I should have multiples of that. So I think <clears throat> when we think of development, you know, if you want to take how old your son or daughter is today, and what's really important is how they're playing when they're 17 or 18 years old. And if they're deciding, you know, what D1, you know, school they want to go to or whatever level they can reach as a player, whatever their goal is, you know, for their tennis, whatever it may be, you know, you want to be able to play your best tennis as a junior player when you're 17, 18. And that's the most important thing. So what does that mean? You know, it means you have to have a long-term vision for your game. You know, I... Um, I was working with James Blake one time, and I was talking to his coach, and I said, Coach, you know, what kind of, what kind of game style does James have? You know, and because uh, to my way of thinking, there's kind of four game styles. There's serve and volley, which is kind of a dinosaur. They're kind of extinct. That's becoming more of a tactic now than an actual game style. That's kind of a tactic of probably an all-court player. Uh, there's the all-court player, which we in, in the USTA, in our player development program, we really stress teaching an all-court game. And, and then there's this skill development. You know, that, and tennis is such a, a difficult game to play. There's so many skills you need, and there needs to be real intentional coaching around building skills. You know, if you're going out bow hunting in the woods and you have only one arrow in your quiver and you only have one style of play, you reach in, you shoot the arrow at the target, oops, I missed, now I don't have any more arrows. But if you develop a really nice game, like a Federer style kind of all court game, when you go hunting on a tennis court, you have 10 arrows in your quiver. Oh, you know, taking the ball early and trying to come in isn't working today, so maybe I'll use the slice backhand more. Or maybe I'll hit some higher, heavier balls. You know, there's a lot of different ways that you can play and win. So that's why we in the program, I know Vasily and I have talked about this a lot, one of our goals for our, our program here is to develop all-court players who are comfortable, confident, and competent in all three parts of the court. And you can see Nadal here. Nadal has really worked on taking the ball on the rise well. He's, he's really worked on his court positioning and taking the ball more at the top of the bounce. You see on clay, he's pretty good on clay. He's won 11 French Opens. He's, uh, I, don't, I don't know how I'd win a point from the guy if I played him now. Uh, so he defends the court from way back and hits these high heavy balls that are just really nasty and not fun to play against. And then you see him at the net here. Uh, he's got very good volleying skills. Very good volleying skills. And that's one of the things we're working on with the kids. I call them bottom edge skills. You know, a lot of the, a lot of the players that are playing today, top spin, top spin, top spin. And the, what happens with top spin is the top edge of your racket is coming off the ball first. And we go, okay, that's nice, and we all hit nice topspin. What's the bottom edge of the racket doing? You know, if you have this shot, if you have a really nice kind of slice backhand, there's like nine shots you can hit with that, I call it the family of slices. You know, you can hit a really nice approach. You can hit a really good backhand volley. You can hit a chip lob. You can hit a drop shot. You can hit a little short slice. You can hit a nasty approach shot. There's, there's so many shots you can hit with that, that slice backhand. So that's one of the shots we want to develop in all of our players. And it takes time. In fact, at one of my Gullickson Foundation events, Martina Hingis was, was playing. And she was very generous with her time to our Gullickson Foundation. And I asked her, because she was coached by her mother growing up. And I asked her, I said, Martina, when you were developing your game with your mother as your coach, how much time did you spend in each one of these parts of the court? And she said, Gully, I spent 50% of my time at the baseline, and I literally spent 50% of my time at the mid-court 
and the front court. And I would like to argue that the mid court is probably the most misunderstood and least practiced part of the game. That's the on the rise skills, that's swing volley, that's approach shots, that might be a first volley after you serve and volley. All those shots are kind of mid court shots. And they're all fueled by one simple concept of ball recognition. If Vasily and I are playing, he hits me the ball, the ball comes off his racket, the first thing I do is I read where his ball is going to bounce. And then I decide how I'm going to receive the ball. Oh, it's bouncing short to my forehand. I'm going to take two steps in, take the ball on the rise, and catch the top of the bounce and hit it cross court. So that's the kind of ball recognition that you need you know, to be able to develop these types of skills. And like Nadal, for example, you know, he, when he comes to the net, he comes in with such advantage. It's not like Stefan Edberg and Patrick Rafter in the old days, they're serving and volleying on 102 second mile kick serves and coming in and scraping low volleys off the, the bottom of the court. You know, I mean, he hits a huge forehand and the guy's in the dead run like this. And he's coming in to volley and he looks like a superstar volleyer. He has so much advantage that, you know, he's gonna make that volley, but he's a very, very good volleyer. And he also plays some doubles. And that's one thing I wanted to talk about a little bit today, is just playing a little doubles for your kids. A, it's fun. You know, it's a team sport. There's not as much pressure on your kids when they're on a doubles court. It's fun, they can laugh, but they also develop some really nice skills playing doubles. They work on their serve, they work on their return. They're at the net, hopefully, volleying once in a while. Um, you know, they're learning how to hit angles, and they're learning different skills in doubles that will serve them well if they kind of supplement what they've learned in doubles and bring it back onto the singles court, okay? <coughs> and Vasily mentioned earlier that 1%. Every time you step on a court, your goal is very simple, get 1% better. So if you start the year with that mentality, at the end of 365 days, do a little quick math, NIU, right? You're gonna be three and a half times better. And how great is that? You've, you've improved three and a half times in one year. So, and, and another kind of uh, thing that I've really been impressed with, with the kids is, is one of my most uh, important factors as a coach, what I look for uh, is the coachability factor. You know, when the kids you know, come to the lesson, they come to the clinic or a private or whatever, you know, they, they have an open mind hey, to listen to the coaches, absorb some information. You know, you don't have to agree with it all. You can, you can disagree with it, you can talk to the coach about it, but just a coachability factor where you're very open to learning and trying to improve your game is such a big factor. And, you know, I hope your kids keep that kind of coachability factor as they progress and kind of go up the food chain a little bit of tennis, okay? Um, I was a director of coaching for the USTA for almost four years, and I had uh, uh, one of our first slides was, uh, you know, we want to develop players that are physically fit. It sounds kind of simplistic, but it's so important. And for kids your age, whatever age they are, I think the more they can buy into the fitness factor, the better tennis player they're gonna be. Because what happens to the game as your kids get older, bigger, stronger, the ball is starting to go a lot faster, the serves are coming much harder, so the game really speeds up. The game just speeds up. And then when you, when you watch pro tennis, you're like, how are these guys reacting to these 140 mile an hour serves and 115 mile an hour forehands? It's just insanity. You know, the, the level of fitness and physicality that the players have. So, at, you know, so physically fit, really kind of, you know, really buy into the fitness factor. You know, there's so much tennis to learn. It's like, oh, isn't it enough to work on my volleys and my second serve? And, 
you know, things like that. Yes, and it is enough, but it all starts with that base of fitness. Technically sound. Okay. Yeah, I mean, my goal for your kids and any young player is to be a mini professional by the time they're 14 years old. They should have every stroke that the pros have by the time they're 14. And that takes a lot of skill development and what I call intentional coaching. And sometimes you have to slow down to actually make progress. You just can't run around and hit a million balls. There has to be some real kind of intentional coaching going on to, uh, to become technically sound. You know, and that's kind of grips, uh, swing pass, footwork, ball recognition, court position. I know we were lucky enough to host some of the players in the Labor Cup here practicing. I watched Goffin play one day for about an hour, and I'm a big fan, you know, because anybody whose kid is not going to be 6'10", like Isner, which would probably include all of us in this room, okay? <laughs> Who do we watch? I mean, on the men's side, or, you know, on the women's side, who do you watch? Well, you watch Sloan Stevens, you watch Madison Keys, you watch who? Diego Schwartzman. My wife's taller than he is. She walked by him the other day, and I'm like, wow, you're taller than Diego. Yeah, but what does the guy do? He, he's the second best returner on the tour next to Nadal. And Nadal broke serve like 35 or 36% of the time. Schwartzman was second in return of serve. He broke serve like 34% of the time, some ridiculous stat on the, men, on the men's side. Huh? Better than Djokovic? Yeah, Djokovic is pretty high up there, too. He's, he's got a, an amazing return. Uh, tactically wise, okay. You know, that kind of goes into what style of player are you? To me, there's, you know, the, forget about the serve and volley. There are not many kids that are serving and volleying, but all-court player, aggressive baseliner, counterpuncher. Counterpunchers are also kind of disappearing. And that's guys or girls who can run all day and get one more ball back. In fact, I was lucky enough to play on the tour for 11 years against some pretty good players, Borg, Connors, McEnroe, all those guys. I lost to all of them quite a bit. Managed to sneak out a few wins once in a while. And you know, they asked Borg one time, you know, who was a man of few words. He didn't speak a lot. But, uh, hey Bjorn, you know, what's your main strategy? Like, how did you win like six French Opens and five Wimbledons? And Bjorn thought about it for a while and he goes, you know, most of the time when the ball would come, I would hit it cross court. And every great once in a while, I would hit one down the line. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's tennis for dummies, right? Tennis, <laughs> tennis 101. But yeah, that worked pretty well. <laughs> Hit a cross court. The net's lower. The, the court is a little longer that way. It's like 81 and a half feet cross court and, and only 78 feet down the line. So you got three and a half more court feet of court to work with. And the net is six inches lower in the middle than it is at the side, side stick. Okay. Uh, tactically wise. So you've got to understand your, I wrote an article for Tennis Magazine a million years ago and it, you could probably still find it somewhere but I described the four styles of play serve and volleyer, all court player, aggressive baseliner and counter puncher and then I made game plans for one to play against the other. And so once you've kind of defined your style of play then you can kind of kind of do your tactics. How do you want to play? How do you want to structure your tennis? What do, I, what do I look like when I'm serving? What do I look like when I'm returning? What do I look like when you and I are in a rally, when, we're, when the ball's in play? How do I want to play? So <clears throat> phase one of development is very simple. You know, I, I think there's parameters around grips. I, I, I would kind of call them ranges of correctness. I don't think there's any one grip, but you know, when I was playing in the dark ages, I know some of the guys played with a continental grip, they played with one grip. McEnroe played with one grip. He was pretty good. <laughs> Stefan Edberg played with one grip. He won seven Grand Slams, and he was number one in the world in singles and doubles at the same time, as was McEnroe. 
Um, so grips are important. Uh, forehand grip, not a big fan of the Western grip. I know Jack Sock has a big Western grip, and he kind of uses the same side of his racket for both shots, which is really bizarre. So if somebody serves his forehand, he'll go like this and hit a forehand this way. They serve his backhand, he flips the racket this way and hits a backhand return and he's got a really strong grip with a dominant hand, which I wouldn't highly recommend. Okay, so grips, like I think <clears throat> on the forehand, uh, range of correctness, I would call it, would be kind of semi-western to strong eastern. A full western grip, you know, the Maui grip or whatever, it's pretty far west. You know, it's tough on wide balls, it's tough on low balls, it's really tough to absorb a fastball coming with the Western grip. And very hard to like square up the racket face with all the, all the movement going on. Uh, stroke production, <clears throat> you know, I think the swing path, I think uh, to me it's very simple. It all starts with the great unit turn. And you watch all the great players play, it, you know, you have a nice, you know, athletic ready position, the ball's coming to my back end, which is to my right. I'm going to open up that near foot and get a nice shoulder turn, and the tip of the racket is going to be up. So now you're ready to play. Very simple. Split step, nice unit turn. You're loading that outside leg. Your racket is up. You want to hit top spin, you drop it down, accelerate through. You want to hit slice from there, you cock your wrist a little bit, and accelerate the bottom edge of the target. And on the forehand side, it's from the split step. You open up that near foot, you get a nice unit turn, fear the L, look out, here comes my forehand. Tip of the racket up. Very simple. You watch Djokovic, you watch Federer, you watch all the top girls, Sloan Stevens, Madison Keys, all the top girls, Serena, they all do the exact same thing. Um, court positioning. Um, you want to take the strongest court position you can based on the ball you're receiving. So say, say I'm playing Vasily, and on this particular day, he's hitting a lot of short balls, like just past the service line when we're in a rally. So why do I need to stand 10 feet behind the baseline? I don't. I'm going to maybe stand right up on the baseline and look to take as many balls on the rise as I can. But if I'm playing him the next day and he's hitting every ball two feet from the baseline, I've got to move my home base back. I might start four or five feet behind the baseline. But you also have to be willing uh, to move in diagonals. And that's what the good players do. They move in diagonals really, really well. You know, if the ball is out to the left, instead of like circling the wagons and kind of running this way and then running up, you know, they, they take a nice diagonal to the ball where they're, they're, they're cutting it off and they're taking it early. Or if they you know, hit a deep ball, like say, the ball's coming deep to my forehand. I'm not going to crash on the bounce point there, but I'm going to diagonal back and load behind the ball and then produce, uh, you know, probably a higher shot from that position. Okay, so you've got to be willing to move in diagonals, and you always want to establish court position. And I will say one thing that all the great players do, they are really disciplined with the recovery after they hit the ball. That's probably one of the least taught skills in tennis. You know, it's all about the strokes and everything, but, but when I hit a ball, Vasily and I are playing, I hit a ball down the line, okay? I hit a forehand down the line. As soon as a ball leaves my racket, I, I need to get on the, the other side of that hash mark that divides the baseline to be in good position based on where I hit the ball. So as soon as I make that strike, and go down the line, I'm recovering and getting to that position as quickly as I can. And then right before he hits the ball, I'm going to fundamentally do two things. I'm going to square my shoulders up to the ball, I'm going to take a nice split step, and now I can react to his shot. Remember the four R's. Ready, read the ball, react, recover. Okay, and that's what all the great players do. And they do it time after time after time, ball after ball after ball. In shot selection, you just have to be <clears throat> aware of where you are in the court. And I tell the kids all the time, 
If you're in the green zone, way behind the court, if you're in Baghdad somewhere in the green zone, you want to play the Golden Arches McDonald's shot. You want to play the high heavy and give yourself time to get back up on the court. But if you're inside the court in, in the Pacific Ocean, in the blue part of the court, you're going to be stepping in and you're going to be driving through the ball a little bit more and you're going to be probably on your front leg a little bit more. So you don't want to kind of come inside the court and go like this with an open stance. You want to kind of step in on that shorter ball and really drive through the ball. So your, your shot selection is based on, on your court position. It's also the score. You've got to play to the score. You know, if I'm up 40 love, I can open up the playbook and maybe try a stupid drop shot or something because I'm up 40 love. But if I'm down, you know, 30-40, it's probably not the best time to hit my first drop shot of the match when I'm one point. And my, my twin brother Tim and I had the great honor one time of working with Pancho Segura for a week. And he was one of the best tacticians ever as a coach. You know, he coached Jimmy Connors for quite a while. And uh, <clears throat> he, he always used to say, play to score, buddy, play to score. You know, when, you, you know, when you're two, two points up or more, you can open the playbook. But when you're even in score or behind, you play percentages, okay? You play the percentage shots. Okay, so <clears throat> we're building an all-court game, and that's important. We're working on those shots and all those different parts of the court. Uh, the serve, incredibly complex stroke to learn, a lot of moving parts, okay? But we, we want to be able to, to build a serve that's reliable, where you can hit your spots, and you can use variety. You know, you, you can hit the, the slice serve, maybe the flat, you know, when your kids are littler, it's hard for them to hit a flat serve, but, you know, the hard slice, the top spin, you know, mixing up the spins, speeds, and placements, and you want to have a technically really solid serve, but all the power, everybody thinks racket, racket, racket. Uh, you know, Brian, our, our physical coach, will tell you, you know, it all starts with the legs. I mean, tennis is a lower body sport. All the power in tennis comes from the legs and the loading phase of, of the stroke. So you watch a good server, like Isner's got an amazing serve, Federer's got, you know, all these guys. When they toss the ball, they get in this nice loaded position here, you know, they're, they're, the first move from this position, the loaded position, is they're driving their legs. So it's like an NBA rebounder. It'd be like toss, load, and then explode. You get that good explosion with the legs, and that drives the, you up and in, into the court. Um, and <clears throat> after the serve, you know, the forehand's probably the biggest shot in the game. I mean, you watch Djokovic. You mentioned Djokovic, who's obviously got one of the best two-hand backhands ever in the game. It's right up there with Agassiz, for sure. But he plays probably 60% of the court with his forehand, maybe 65%. And a guy like Nadal will play 75, 80% of the court with his forehand. Reason being, it's just a more flexible shot. A forehand, you can hit it bigger. You know, some of the guys, you know, Del Patro hit 115 mile an hour forehand, you know, this summer at Wimbledon. I'm like, what? 115, is that kilometers or miles? You know, what is it? But uh, so building weapons as your players get bigger and stronger. I would highly recommend we continue to strive to build the forehand into the weapon. And I, I think on the women's side now, you, you watch the top players in the women's game now, they're doing that more and more. You know, 10, 15 years ago, if I was playing with a WTA player and I fed the ball right down the middle, 98% of them would step around their forehand to hit a backhand just because they had this kind of two second hand on the racket, they had the safety factor built into the stroke. And now, you know, like Sloan, Madison, they're playing a big percentage of court with their forehand now. They're really trying to build that weapon on the forehand side. Uh, I mentioned the, the volleying skills, the bottom edge skills, the slice, the, you know, I call it intangible. Some players have great intangibles, others don't. And, and, and you gotta be able to develop you know, good continental grip skills, where you can, if I get put in an awkward part of the court, say low to my forehand, I can't really hit it, gotta reach down and, and hit a nice defensive slice, 
or, or certainly the bottom edge skills on the volleys and the slices, very, very important skills to develop because not only can you use them to defend the court, you can play a good defense, but if you have a really good, good slice, I tell the kids, do you want a butter knife or a steak knife? A butter knife is nice, it slices through the butter, but a steak knife, you can really do some damage. So you want to really be able to knife that slice and accelerate through. And, and, and you can not only use it to defend the court, but you can also use it to attack with a good approach or even using it to kind of change direction. And, and, it's, and it's a very, very uh, good shot to use. And we will keep, uh, keep working on that with your kids, defining and refining your style of play. Uh, as you get bigger and stronger and the serve starts developing, the, the kids are hitting the ball harder, they're going to develop their style of play. And, you know, how do you like to play? How do you win most of your points? You know, it, these are some of the questions that we're going to ask your kids. And then, you know, once they kind of understand how they like to play and what their real strengths are, then, you know, we'll work hard on building those strengths and, and, and if you have a certain style of play, like say you're an aggressive baseliner, well, you really want to be good at taking the ball on the rise and driving through it. You know, it's not good to say, oh, I want to be an aggressive baseliner, and you're lifting every ball and just hitting loops all the time. That's not an aggressive baseliner. Aggressive baseliner has to drive, drive through the ball. <clears throat> and then uh, just embracing the fun and challenge of doubles, I mean, uh, you know, doubles is still a, a pretty good part of college tennis, and we're, we've got the ITA uh, indoors, national indoors coming. I, they just asked me to speak at the banquet. They said they'd buy me a free dinner, which, you know, I, I, I'm pretty cheap these days. So, uh, you know, a nice meal. So they're coming. So, uh, you know, it was very interesting, I got to say, watching Mike Bryan, who's 40 years old, playing old school classic serve and volley doubles playing with Jack Sock because Bobby had a hip replacement so he was out most of the year and you know they won two slams they won Wimbledon the US Open and they just won the 0-2 in London and, and, and Mike serving and volleying first and second serves and coming in all the time you know Jack serving big and going around and, and whipping that big western <laughs> forehand and uh, his the speed and the quality of his forehand was kind of overwhelming the, the volleying skill of those guys at the net. And uh, it was very interesting dynamic to watch how an old school doubles player teamed up with a, a, a new school kind of guy. Okay, and here, here's another quote. Uh, the most important six inches in tennis. You know, if you would guess maybe, you know, three inches before contact and three inches after the contact, that would be a really good guess because all the good stuff happens out in front of you. Nothing good happens kind of even or behind you. But really, the most important six inches in tennis that your kids can ever develop is between their left ear and their right ear. And I had the good fortune in 1982 <laughs> to uh, work with a sports psychologist by the name of Dr. Jim Lair, who's written like 16 books on the subject. He's kind of the world-renowned expert, and I have to say I was a pioneer. I was the first professional tennis player to publicly admit that I needed mental help. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I had lost seven matches that year, you know, up through Wimbledon. I lost seven matches, seven, six, and the third. So I was playing really good tennis, but I'd get to the end of the match, and I had so much anxiety about winning, I'd get in the tiebreaker in the third set and I literally froze up and I couldn't play. So we went to visit some friends in Denver and this lady said, yeah, I played in this Easter Seals tournament. I played with this guy who was a pro, but he's also like a sports psychologist. His name is Jim Lair. And uh, maybe you should talk to him, you know? I said, well, it can't hurt. So I had dinner with the guy and I liked what he had to say at dinner. He comes out. We work on things like in between points, how you hold your racket, holding your racket like this in your non-dominant hand, your, your body language, your self-talk, you're using visualization, 
and I never really thought about this stuff before. This was 1982. And, you know, at the end of the three days we worked together, I said, Doc, this has really been great. How much do I owe you? And he said, you know, um, I'm just trying to get started in this field. And, you know, I've worked with the, some of the Denver Broncos and the Denver basketball team, but, you know, I really love tennis. Tennis is my first passion, so if something I've said or done helps you, if you just give me a plug in an article or interview, we'll, we'll call it even. Otherwise, uh, you know, you can pay me and our relationship will remain anonymous, kind of like Michael Anthony. So I said, I like that option better. I like, I'll give you a plug. So I went to Phoenix and I played team tennis. I finished second in singles, second in, in, uh, in doubles, and I won the mix. I got a check for like 60 grand, go to the open, get to the quarters of the singles. Tim and I got to the semis of the doubles. All the guys in the locker room like, hey, Gully, you laid on your shrink's couch lately and all this kind of stuff. <laughs> and all of a sudden at the open, they're going, hey, what's that guy's name? You think he'd mind if I give him a call? <laughs> so, so, yeah, I mean, the whole mental part of the game is huge. And I, and I, and I tell uh, the pro players that I work with all the time, especially the more younger guys, the developing players, I said, when you're playing a tennis match, it's hard enough. You and I are playing, you're trying to beat me up, and I'm trying to beat you up. Now, if every time I miss a ball, if I'm being really negative, I'm beating myself up, it becomes two against one. It's, it's you against me, and then me against myself. So you, when you're playing, you want to keep it to one-on-one. -on -one. You know, you don't want to make it a two-on-one -on -one against yourself. I don't like those odds. So, <clears throat> so yeah, when your kids are developing, you know, we really like to see, you know, this is all coming from the USDA. They've done a million, uh, you know, a bunch of research on all this stuff. We like to see kind of a ratio of two wins for every loss. You know, if you're losing all the time, that's not good. If you're winning all the time, that's not good. Because what are losses? Losses are learning opportunities. Thank you for beating me. You just proved to me I need a better backhand. Your forehand and my backhand big win for you. So I'm going to go out and work with my coach. I'm going to shore up that backhand and I'm going to be better the next time we play. So thank you very much. In fact, Federer said something very funny about his backhand because when he, when he started on the tour, obviously when the players see one hand backhand, they always go heavy to the backhand and up high. And Federer, and they, they talked about Federer, well, how did you get a better backhand? He said, well, I'd like to thank my fellow competitors on the, on the ATP tour. I think in the first three years I played on the tour, I probably hit two million backhands. So I'd like to thank all you guys for giving me a better backhand. Okay, so losses are learning opportunities. That's all they are. And what are your takeaways? Okay, my second serve got beat up. Um, I court positioning, I found myself way behind the court too much, and the guy hit like 10 drop shot winners against me, so clearly I had a little bit of court positioning issue, and you know, my backhand broke down a little bit. Okay, great. Well, then you go out and you work on that stuff, and uh, you know what? You're gonna get better, you're gonna get better. So, uh, yeah. Okay, this leads us into uh, the physical part. And uh, as you can see, I'm not an expert on the physical part. But, <laughs> but uh, you know, it doesn't take any talent to get fit. All it takes is discipline and effort. That's all it takes, you know, and, and some good guidance by some good people. Okay, but the number one building block you know, to being a good tennis player is a physical fitness. That's the bottom of the pyramid. You've got to be fit. And as your sons and daughters get bigger, stronger, faster, the ball is going to speed up. The game really speeds up at the higher levels. So you need the physicality and you need, the kids need to commit. Sure, okay, I'm playing tennis three or four times a week and 
I'm playing a lot of tennis, but you know, this is an extra, this is an add-on. It's really the base. It's, it's really something that we all need to try to commit to. Okay.